Hi friends, another Friday has dawned upon us, which means another Friends of France Friday. It's February already? February. The month of love. The month where I still have no love life. Hello. But it's okay. Our episode today is all about one thing that I'm always sure of. It will be there for me when I'm both happy and sad. It can always make me happy. It will never leave me or leave me empty and hungry food. I always get so excited and happy about eating good food. Honestly, I live for food. I live to eat. She ate. <laughs> What's your favorite food? Do you have a favorite dish or restaurant or perhaps something you cook? I think one of my biggest mishaps in life is never enjoying how to cook or being more passionate about learning how to cook. I think it's because I always love trying out new restaurants in the city. I mean, New York City is flooded. Whatever cuisine you want, Whatever avenue or street you find yourself in, there is always something new to try. And I love food so much. I love discovering new food. I love discovering new cuisines and tasting new things and trying out new flavors. And one of my favorite areas in the city to eat? K-Town. Koreatown, New York. My second home at this rate. Korean barbecue? Korean fried chicken? Galbi Tang? Korean food has definitely been one of my go-to cuisines for the past few years. Beyond the delicious flavors and homey feeling that it gives me, I am so amazed by the culture and stories that they possess. According to a 2019 Journal of Ethnic Foods article entitled Medicinal Food Understanding in Korean Gastronomic Culture, we are told of the countless health benefits that Korean cuisine has been providing for centuries. To keep the body warm and healthy, the Koreans have developed fermented foods like kimchi that improve metabolism. Korean gastronomy has been established in healthy food. In fact, it says that Koreans do not eat food to become full. Foods are prepared and consumed to be healthy in order to prevent diseases. Something else interesting is that it is said that a traditional Korean table includes dishes and garnitures formed by five colors that create the five elements. Wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. But beyond just the quality and taste of Korean cuisine, one beauty of the culture is the communal, family-style aspect of Korean cuisine. I mean, what better way to enjoy great food than sharing it with your loved ones? It truly is healing, both figuratively and literally. The reason that I go into this deep dive of food and specifically the traditions of Korean cuisine? Because our expert guest for today's episode provides healing with his skilled hands, also both figuratively and literally. We are joined today by the incredible Dr. Yoon Sung, a physician and a chef. With an undergraduate degree in public health, a master's degree in clinical epidemiology, and medical education and training in family medicine, Dr. Yoon has definitely shown his passion for caring for others at the bedside, as he currently stands as an urgent care supervising physician for Carbon Health and UCLA Health. But beyond the clinic and hospital halls, he takes off his white coat to don the apron, where he provides another form of healing, through cooking and serving others with delicious food. Chef Yoon is the owner-to-be and chef of Aksusu a contemporary Korean-inspired restaurant that seeks to showcase the beauty of traditional Korean ingredients and the communal family-style dining of Korean culture. He is known online as Cooking with Yoon, based on his blog, where he shares his journey from medicine to the culinary arts, alongside gastronomic photographs and principal budget-friendly recipes, some of which he has created for his patients. Chef Dr. Yoon's work has been featured in the annual HMARC calendar, with his recipe video displayed in stores across the nation. Hear the story of the white coats and the apron. Hello. Hi. Yay. Thank you so much for joining me. Sure. Thanks for having me. Of course. I've been so excited. We've had different physicians come on. One was a rock star turned anesthesiologist, yoga teacher turned picky doctor, this turned this doctor, and it's like... You need someone who knows how to cook. Uh-huh. And <laughs> yeah, it's just so for fitting and so right. So thank you so much. If you could first please introduce yourself to everybody. Yeah, my name is Yoon, Yoon Sung, or Dr. Sung. Trained in family medicine right now, working in urgent care and also a chef. Yeah, I mean, such an amazing mix of worlds. I mean, no pun intended, but it's like a fusion, right? Of <laughs> two yeah. different spheres, and which we will dissect and talk about. Again, thank you for joining me I, I wanted to first dive into your journey into medicine like where did this inspiration come from is it family friends or personal experience yeah i mean both of my parents are in medicine so my dad's a neurologist and then my mom 
she has a nurse. Now she works in hospital administration. So mm-hmm. I think since from a young age, they really pushed for medicine. And so for a really long time, I resisted because I'm the type that if someone tells me to do something, I don't want to do it. Yeah. And then I went to college and I actually went to college undecided on my major. And then during orientation, I went to all the different majors and then I discovered public health, which to me, that was like a really new concept, but I was actually always really interested in like international relations. Like I wanted to work for the UN and I discovered this concept of public health where, you know, health is not just about like disease, but about like socioeconomic factors that go into it. And then about like how important it is about global health Mm -hmm. and helping Understood. And it kind of was like, you know, I think this actually might be the best major for me. And so even though I resisted for a long time, I decided to like learn more about public health. And then mm-hmm. I think second year of college, I volunteered at a free health clinic. And then I was like, this is it. Like we serve patients for free at this free clinic and they were homeless patients and underserved patients. And for me, it just like felt right in my gut where I was like, I think this is my calling. And so even though I really wanted to resist, for a long time I kind of like I think public health primary care is where I want to go and then even first year of med school I worked with family physicians who provided long-term you know comprehensive care for underserved patients and then I was like I think this is it and I never looked back Mm -hmm. you know I went on every rotation my first rotation was actually neurosurgery which I loved I actually loved every single rotation Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day family medicine was what stood out to me yeah I mean I feel like just the beauty with family medicine right you get just like a bit of everything inculcated in this like internal medicine too right like you see from all different ages and from all different type of problems and i guess that fits that you enjoyed all of your rotations in medical school i know you're talking about the resistance that you had at first going to medicine i think that's also just the fact that medicine is such a long and stressful road, right? I mean, like, what is it, four years of undergrad and four years of med school and then however many years of residency or some choose to do fellowship and so much money involved and time and studying, parties you couldn't go to, yeah. family occasions you can't go <laughs> yeah. to. At the end of it all, do you have any regrets pursuing the field up to where you are now? You know, um, I actually don't think once I truly like ever regretted it, I think I definitely missed out on a lot of like weddings, family functions, and, you know, so many events. But I think in medical school, it was really hard where I think there was just like a such a disconnect where especially like first two years where Mm -hmm. you're learning these like preclinical sciences. I was like, what does this have to do with the patient I'm about to see? But I think in residency, no matter how hard it was, I never once doubted my path. And, you know, there were definitely moments where I'm like, okay, I've been in school training for like 10 years. And then my friends that I graduated college with that have been working in like finance or whatever for 10 years, like there's so much ahead in like life and finances than I am. But I think despite that, like in residency, like as hard as it was, like I was always with patients, seeing patients. And so it just like reaffirmed for me, like the path that I took. So I, I don't know. I don't think I ever once truly regretted it. You know, yeah. we all complain and we're all like, oh, what if? But yeah, I think for me, I never doubted my path. Yeah, I think there's this meme that says like, I'll complain every second, but I won't give up. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I guess that Very encapsulates true. it. And then, like you said, you, you went into family medicine and I think family medicine has a lot of ties with public health too, right? Which you drew interest from. But why specifically family medicine though, as opposed to like, I know public health is its own specialty as well, right? Yeah, I think for me, family medicine, there was just something about being able to like see every age and every different specialty. And like, I was like, if I want to do culinary medicine and then also be able to you know, like work on like nutrition, prevention, counseling, then I was like family medicine is the best specialty for me. And then I've always also been really passionate about global health. So Mm -hmm. I was like, if I want to be able to, you know, serve globally, I was like, family medicine is what makes me the most useful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for that reason, that's kind of why I went into it. And what do you think is the best part of being a physician or specifically a family medicine physician? 
I think for a family physician, like, so I've worked, I guess, most recently abroad in mm-hmm. like underserved, like very rural area in South Africa, mm-hmm. where I don't know, like 23% of the population was HIV positive. And mm-hmm. it's just like a super rural area. Mm-hmm. And it reaffirmed for me that family medicine was the right decision, at least for me, because they were like, okay, doc, like we can have you deliver babies. We can have you see HIV patients. We can have you, I don't know, like help out with adults or, or like even in the ED. So they were like, we'll have you wherever you want. And so I was just like, oh, I'll just go wherever you want me to help mm-hmm. out. So I worked in the HIV clinic, like by myself, seeing patients. Mm-hmm. And so I think for me, it was like, where can I be the most useful? And for me, like if my calling is like underserved population, relations then this is what makes me the most useful yeah that's beautiful i mean medicine itself is beautiful and you know it's great to talk about but i really want to dive into the part that's very exciting for me is uh i feel like this you no know, mixture of worlds i mean in your world specifically of medicine and the culinary arts right i wanted to know where did this inspiration now come from for cooking i mean being a chef yourself like did it come before for medicine or after? I would say after. Um, I mean, I was always really interested in cooking. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom is actually a really good cook, but she mm-hmm. never wanted me to like learn it. So even when I was younger, like if my dad and my brother were out, like I would with my mom, like if she's cooking, I would want to be in the kitchen mm-hmm. and stuff. But she's like, oh, you know, like men aren't supposed to cook. Like she kind of. I don't know what I need to not be in the kitchen, but I would still kind of watch from afar and observe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always really interested in like, cooking, but it wasn't until after college that I finally actually had time to cook and also, mm-hmm. you know, just like develop a hobby. And so because I was living in a food desert in Baltimore, that's when I actually had time to sort of experiment and cook. So I would say I was always pre-med and that was kind of like the primary, I guess, profession. But then mm-hmm. I sort of like took this detour and then I, again, kind of, even though I didn't want to explore that side, I was like, oh, maybe I do have passion for and a talent for in this field. Mm -hmm. I would say the culinary came after, yeah. After medicine. And I guess it's also helpful, like during residency, you can cook for yourself, right? Or if you had time to cook for yourself. Well, residency, I honestly, I mostly ate at the hospital. Like, I mean, residency, I would force myself to cook like if I had a break to keep up with the culinary Mm -hmm. um, skills but like I was so tired so I was saying I'm just gonna eat at the hospital even for dinner just gonna buy food and then go home Um, yeah 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 I mean having found your love for cooking you know I guess like you said after medicine did you ever feel like you had to choose between the two was there ever a moment where like i can't be living like hannah montana where i'm like a normal girl <laughs> and, here and then i'm a pop star at night like did you ever have to choose between the you felt like you had to choose between the two fields yeah i mean i would say once i moved out here i actually was like i have to lead medicine mm-hmm. for you know a year or two and if I'm going to open up my own place, I can't really be working in medicine. Right now, I'm kind of doing half and half. But yeah, I think, you know, because usually I think both are professions that sort of require the totality of your being. And like, I don't think it's really common or heard of to be able to kind of juggle like a profession outside of medicine or culinary. So yeah, definitely was like, I'm going to have to sacrifice one. But right now, it's like a hybrid model that's working. But yeah, probably once I actually open up my own place, I do have to leave medicine at least for temporarily. Yeah. I mean, I know we talked about regret going to medicine in itself, and you said that you have no regrets. But with now, like, cooking in the equation, is there regret to that in that regard where it's like, oh, maybe I should have, I don't know, what? Well, I guess you wouldn't have found out about cooking until after medicine, but did you ever wish like, oh, I wish I discovered cooking earlier than medicine? Oh, yeah. It's definitely something I thought about. I mean, I would say both in a way are a little bit delayed gratification, Mm -hmm. but I do think medicine is like a more formal Mm -hmm. path where it's Mm -hmm. like you have to spend 10, 12 years before you get gratification, (laughs) unfortunately. I think in culinary, if you're good, if you're talented, if you're hardworking, there is like, you have to work your way up, but it is could be quicker. So... Because these days, I think in the culinary industry, like not everyone has to go to like a renowned, mm-hmm. you know, culinary school. Like you can work in certain restaurants and work your way up. So 
I have thought about that a lot. I was like, you know, now I'm a little bit older. And like, if I had started cooking out of high school, then I probably would have been much in a much better position than I am now. <laughs> but I don't know. But at the same time, I do think like I've worked really hard towards my medical degree and it's something I'm passionate about. And so in that sense, I think I don't have regrets because I think now I'm able to kind of have the best of both worlds. And, you know, I think my career is just starting. And so I am proud of the path that I've come, I guess, as long as as long and hard as it has been. I often wish I had perfect vision. There is so much intricacy in life and beauty in the world around me that I often miss because my view can get so blurry. Though I had glasses for years, I opted never to wear them because of the embarrassing indentations and marks they left behind in my face. Covery seeks to target this common struggle within the eyewear market. Covery is a 100% AAPI woman-owned inclusive eyewear brand designed for comfort, offering a wide range of sunwear and specs with prescription lens options. With their signature elevated fit that features longer nose pads, a reduced frame curvature, and a narrow nose bridge to elevate the frame, Covery is designed to better complement diverse facial features such as low nose bridges and high cheekbones for an effortless fit. Beyond this, the premium handcrafted frames are made from plant-based acetate and lenses with 100% UV protection. Find your perfect fit with their offers of a home and virtual try-on. With the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, you can get $20 off any frame you like on shopkovri.com. See the world's beauty more comfortably with Kovri. This offer is valid in one frame per order, cannot be combined with any other offers, and is limited to one use per customer. There are luxuries in life that see beyond material things. Practices like self-care and skincare can be an oasis in the whirlwinds and busyness of life. But what if there exists a harmony between material and immaterial luxuries? House of M Beauty is a saffron-infused luxury skincare line that harnesses the antioxidant, vitamin C-rich, anti-inflammatory, and antibacterial power of the highest quality medicinal-grade saffron. They are a clean treatment skincare line suitable for sensitive and postpartum skin. Their unique and cautiously crafted formulations maximize the potency of medicinal saffron to calm and soothe sensitive skin while brightening and targeting skin concerns. From their skin polish, to the miracle serum, to the glow jelly mask, and the silk night concentrate, experience the luxurious transformation saffron can bring to your skin with the code FRANZ20, that's F-R-A-N-Z-2-0, for 20% off your first order on houseofmbeauty.com, also available at Nordstrom Nationwide. As a nurse, I am on my feet, alert for 12 hours or more each day. There is no space for drowsiness or lethargy in my job because my patient's well-being is at stake. Sometimes, you just need the extra energy boost from coffee. Robusta Coffee offers two times more caffeine and antioxidants with 60% less sugar. But did you know that thanks to its climate and fertile volcanic soil, Vietnam is the world's second largest coffee producer and the number one grower of Robusta. Nguyen Coffee Supply is America's first specialty, women-owned Vietnamese coffee company set to change the future of coffee through sustainability, diversity, and inclusion. They only roast coffee beans that are hand-picked at peak ripeness from direct trade Vietnamese farms to produce sweet and flavorful coffee without any additives, flavorings, or oils. Get your own velvety coffee experience for 15% off your order with the code FRANZ15, that's F-R-A-N-Z-1-5, at newincoffeesupply.com. I'm curious if there's anything about medicine throughout the years that you spent studying and training that you think adds flavor. Um, there's so many puns in this episode that adds to like you being a chef or in the cooking sphere. Is there any aspect of being a doctor or medicine that like supports that, whether it's like personality or a skill or something? And vice versa, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think one of the similarities that the two fields have is I think they're very high stress fields and where you are on your feet for a really long time and really long hours. So I think in one way, like I think just like being high stress environment, even in medicine has helped me to deal with some of the stresses of like being on the line when you're just like in the weeds and getting mm -hmm. like a ton of tickets. Like that is one thing, but I think being a provider and seeing so many patients of different backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds, I think helped me to relate to a lot of people. So I think in the culinary industry, there's a lot of like sort of like owners and then like cooks or like prep. Mm -hmm. So there's like a hierarchy of some sort, but 
I have found that for me, like no matter what role I'm in, like even if I'm in more of like a chef role or even if some people view me more of like a managerial role, I have found that because I've worked with a lot of patients who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds or certain cultures, like I am able to establish rapport really easily with like no matter who in the kitchen. Yeah. I think the kitchen's very, very like whoever wants to come work, if you can put in the work, like you're welcome yeah. and they hire you and you just have to prove your worth. But sometimes it can be hard to establish rapport with people right away. But I have found that for me, it's easy to establish rapport. I think maybe because I've worked with a lot of different patients. Yeah, yeah definitely. But I feel like another way that you mix the two worlds really well is I know that you created recipes for patients before mm -hmm. and like you led clinics or like cooking demos in clinic can you talk more about that yeah i mean um when i was applying to residency i specifically was looking for a program that would help me to like support my culinary background as well and so my residency program uh, my program director when she interviewed me was like we can definitely help take your culinary background to help our patients and she really held true to that like throughout residency I was able to hold cooking demos for patients and we worked in the FQHC and then the main hospital where the family med program was at, it was a county hospital mm -hmm. where we served a lot of Medi-Cal or homeless patients mm -hmm. or uninsured patients. So for me, I'm like, you know, I've lived in the food desert in Baltimore. Like when you have a dollar to provide your for your family, like why wouldn't you? you buy a bag of chips over like an apple, you know, where it can provide so many more calories and provide for so many people so for me that was kind of the inspiration between okay let me create some recipes that are healthy but also cost effective mm -hmm. and you know easy for patients to mm -hmm. make so yeah that was kind of like my passion project throughout residency and that was like one of the ways i could keep cooking yeah i mean that's so true i, I did have an episode before with a nutritionist a registered nutritionist <laughs> also a cardiologist and i mean we were talking about how I mean, I guess there's so many medical guidelines on how to eat or what to eat that's healthy, right? But then sometimes you don't take into account the atmosphere of the people we're telling this to, right? Like the socioeconomic status. We want them to get fruits or vegetables, but this, is there actually a market nearby? Or right. are they living paycheck to paycheck and they cannot afford these healthy meals or to cook these healthy meals, right? And I, th I think when it comes to like food sustainability and like socioeconomic status, it's such a important topic that we don't really get to talk a lot about that I know that you talk a lot about. Can you share probably one dish that you think is very cost effective and also very healthy as well yeah um i think one thing i've really liked experimenting with is uh, you know oats everyone thinks about oats as like more of a sweet dish like yeah. with brown sugar mm -hmm. cinnamon mm -hmm. things like that but for me i was like well oats can actually be a really good source of like fiber and like healthy carbs but there are ways to make it savory so in clinic i did one with like you know just like vegetable stock and like butternut squash mm -hmm. and you know like so sort of like veggies and you know i've done like oatmeal versions where it's more with like fried egg and so i think there's a lot of ways to make this like really nutritious ingredient savory rather than just mm -hmm. like a sweet breakfast yeah i love that i mean i think also within the past few years everyone's been about like Oats, oh, it's right, like overnight oats and oh, yeah. all, all of those sure. things. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the culinary field and within the field, it's really, it's all about like food, right? I mean, I love food. I, I love to eat. I'll, I'll eat anything that's in front of me. And when it comes to food, I want to share something that you stated before that you said that you believe in the therapeutic power of sharing a meal with mm -hmm. loved ones. And I think this is the crux of I mean, your, your work as, as a chef, right? And, and just the whole culinary field in itself. What does, can you explain more what that means to you that regarding the therapeutic power of meal sharing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I would say that even, you know, going centuries back, I feel like food was the original medicine that kind of sustained our ancestors for centuries, right? And then I think even in historic times, there was always something about communal eating where you like bring stuff and you gather together around the table. And I think even though even growing up with families, like even if we didn't want to, like there's something about just like coming together and sharing. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I don't know, for me, I think there is something about 
you know, even for me, like when I've worked in like global health in like rural Argentina, rural South Africa, where it's like, even if I'm just like completely foreign country where I don't know anything about the food or the culture, there's something about like my host family or like this, these people that don't know me who invite me to their table mm -hmm. and we just like gather together. And then even if you can't communicate in like the language and you know, you pass around the food around the table and there's something just so welcoming and healing about that, that I think no matter what situation or, you know, like where you are in life, like, I think that's like a good universal factor. So I think, yeah, that's, there's something to be said about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like there's just something about food that like connects everybody, right? Or even if someone is in a new country and they're trying a food of that country, they'll be like, oh, this kind of reminds me of my own cuisine from when I, I don't know, had a meal with my family or that I used to grow up in. And I think also with the sense of taste, right? Or the smell or even the sight, it's like brings so much memories. I mean, I remember like if I eat some food, I'm like, oh, I used to eat this when I was younger. And it's just so reminiscent and so nostalgic. And I guess you, like you put all of that into you know, the things that you create, which I, I know you're a pastry chef at Hanchi in LA. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about your work there? Yeah, so right now um, I'm working with this restaurant called Hanchi in Koreatown. So it was a restaurant that I did when I first pop up in, in LA back in November. And then I just found that we had this like really similar shared vision of like making more traditional Korean mm -hmm. stuff approachable. So then the opportunity came to join the team potentially. And then, you know, they already had a chef and a sous chef. So I didn't want to kind of like overstep their boundaries. And so I was like, okay, I could bring like some desserts to the menu. So that's how I came to join the team as a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it's Hanshik is also sort of in this transition period where we're just doing like monthly pop-ups. And so mm -hmm. right now, it's just me and Justin, the head chef, as a duo, just doing these monthly pop-ups. And so... Yeah, like I don't just do the pastry review, I like, kind of come up with the whole menu together, but it's been this like really exciting thing where we're going through different venues, like all throughout LA and do the different menu each time. So that's been really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think would be your go to pastry that you've made so far? Go to pastry. I, I mean, you know, I kind of dabble in, I guess, like all pastries, mm -hmm. but. I do think for me, like one of my favorite things to make is like, you know, layer cakes. And I think because cakes can be so versatile and adaptable to like whatever the person that I'm making the cake for. And so I just really like the versatility of it and like how cakes are centered around celebration. So even if it's like just for fun, like me gifting a person, like mm -hmm. it's very celebratory. And I don't know. So Within pastry, cakes have always been my love and always will be. And I think they're just like as much work as they are. I think they're <laughs> so fun to make and something really celebratory about. Them. Yeah, because you can make it your own design and like whatever yeah. layers it is or different colors or if you put fruits. I mean, I'm, I'm such a dessert person. Mm -hmm. I, I'm basically like salivating right now because uh -huh. I have such a sweet tooth. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll go out and even if I don't have like actual meals, as long as I have dessert, you can, you can, you can find me there. And aside from Handshake, I know that you are the owner to be of Oksusu Restaurants, which I know is previously called Nanum. Can you tell us more about the vision and like, where did this idea come from? Yeah. I mean, I was like, you know, when I left the culinary industry, I was like, eventually I'm going to come back to it one day. And I was like, well, now that I finished residency and I can always practice medicine whenever I want, I was like, this is now the time to return to the culinary industry. And mm -hmm. so last year I was, I did a Kickstarter. I was very fortunate to reach the goal. And then, so yeah, that's when I kind of put out my uh, Kickstarter and restaurant idea where, yeah, initially it was called Nanum, which means sharing in Korean, but then there was like a little bit of a name conflict. So then I had to change it to Oksusu, which means corn in Korean. So I think it's very multifaceted. So I think corn, it's like a very humble, but very versatile ingredient. So I think every culture has some kind of like, you know, corn dish or component. And, and then corn is also very beloved 
ingredient in Korean cuisine. And so for me, I was like, okay, like even when people come to eat out susu, like even if they're completely unfamiliar with Korean cuisine, mm -hmm. I want them to be able to find some ingredient or element that's familiar to them. And so I want it to be a very welcoming, mm -hmm. inclusive space. And I think like the restaurant idea for like what I want it to be has evolved over time. But I think ultimately I probably am leaning towards opening just like a wine bar and having it be a space, like I said, is very welcoming and then have some shareable plates that people can just like come and have a good time with their friends. But yeah, that's kind of what I'm leaning towards. I feel like especially the past few years, I mean, Korean food has become more mainstream, right? And it's taken over the world. But I think for the most part, I guess those who are non-Koreans, I think what really comes to mind when it comes to Korean food is like Korean barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. Or kimchi <laughs> or bulgogi or, you know, the famous desserts, right? Yeah. But I know from me watching K-dramas and all of that, that yeah. there's an array, and my friends who are Korean, there's an array of different, you know, delicacies and dishes and traditional foods, you know, within the Korean culture, right? With Aksu, what do you hope to bring to the world when it comes to Korean food that's outside of, again, the mainstream Korean barbecue and desserts? Yeah, I think there's just like certain ingredients and like dishes that I grew up with that I love and I want people to know more about. Like, I would say an ingredient I'm really passionate about is like perilla, which is mm -hmm. like a leaf similar to shiso mm -hmm. that when uh, people go get Korean barbecue, a lot of times they get it, but they don't know what it's called or like what other things can do with it. Or like tenjang, which is similar to miso, but like a Korean soybean paste. So I think for me, it's about making those traditional ingredients like more approachable. So for Oksus, like that's one of the main missions. Like even if it's like one ingredient that someone who doesn't know about it learns about, like that's what my goal would be. Yeah. I mean, outside of ingredients, is there a food or a dish that you ate growing up that you hope the world will get to know more, even if it's outside of your menu? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say one of the items that um, I grew up eating that's like a comfort food and probably like some form of it would be on the menu is like something called takdori tang, which is like a spicy Korean like uh, chicken stew. It has like potatoes and it has like a kochujang kind of like braised sauce. And I don't know, it was just one of those dishes. It's not like, you know, really fancy dish or something, mm. but it's one dish that my mom would make time to time growing up and it's something that was always comforting mm -hmm. to me just with like served with white rice it's like a very comforting stew so i would like to have some sort of that on the menu yeah, yeah. that's exciting oh my gosh um you know i i think also when it comes to you know korean food being mainstream or being more well known around the world right i think social media has a lot to play with that right especially tiktok i mean I'll be scrolling on TikTok and I'm like, oh, someone's eating a, a spicy raw marinated crab. And mm -hmm. it would be something that maybe some people would be un unthinkable of, of <laughs> eating or trying, right? But because of but because of TikTok, they're like, oh, I want to try this now. And then <laughs> you'll see everyone like making tutorials of how to make this or eating that. How do you yeah. think social media will impact the culinary world? world which is very you know tangible and very physical in the years to come hmm. it's hard to say right like i mean i think social media is really powerful and it has capacity to do a lot and like i think in a way probably it will bring more attention to like certain traditional foods like outside of just korean like mm -hmm. you know very traditional things that only like people of that ethnicity or culture might know mm -hmm. about i think there's a way to make that more accessible and so i think if culinary people can use it to their advantage or if influencers whatever can help mm -hmm. to do that then i think there's a lot of good ways it can be used. yeah yeah and i think one of those like trying different foods right and <laughs> things that they they might not think they will like i was watching a tv show i think yesterday and it was about two chefs and it's a drama and then they were in the fish market and then one of the chefs was like oh i don't eat raw fish and then the other chef was like 
you can't call yourself a chef if you're not open to trying other foods. Yeah. For you, is there one food that or one ingredient that you have been tried and you don't think uh-huh. you can try? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think like certain. <laughs> I think like when I talk to like my friends who are from China or like going to like traditional Chinese place, like I think some traditional stuff like <laughs> like or not traditional, but like you know Chinese markets like they talk cats or certain like. I- Eyeballs, things like that. I I don't know. Like, I feel like as a chef, I should try those things once, but I don't know. I just can't. So, is it true as a chef, you have to be able to like? Try I think everything? it's like I think it's like for your palate and like to learn. Like, you should. Like, there's like certain things where I'm like, oh, okay, not trying this. <laughs> or is there something that you've tried once that you're like, enough is enough. <laughs> You know, you know, actually, no. I think I have been pretty open. I would say, I will say, like, you know, not our generation, but, like, our parents' generation. I think in Korea, like, dog was a little bit more common. Mm-hmm. So when I was, like, nine, I had the soup that I really liked. And then my dad said it was, like, chicken soup. And then, like, two hours later, he told me that I had eaten a dog. And I was, like, what? Oh. I felt so sick, but so that's one thing I tried that I would be happy never to eat again. I have to be honest, the same thing happened to me. There was this stew in the Philippines, and I was eating. I was like, wow, this is, this is so good. Like, I want to try this again. They were like, yeah, it's, you know, it's a rare kind of chicken. I was like, hmm, yeah. a rare kind of chicken, only to find out the same thing. And yeah. You are right. The there, is there a fact that I'm ashamed about? It. I was like, I was like, I really enjoyed it. I was like, it's a really great chicken soup. And then, yeah. For me though, I think one thing that I have tried that I may not be opposed to trying again is fried frog. Ah, <laughs> uh, I for promise me. it's not in the shape of a frog. <laughs> I've had it like two or three times. Like I get it, it does taste like chicken, but. I don't know, it's not my favorite thing to eat. I feel like if no one tells me that it's frog. Yeah, if it's not in the shape, yeah. If it's not in the shape, yeah, I think I can handle that. Being in scrubs the whole shift and for days at work can sometimes strip you of your sense of fashion and self-expression. But instilling a bit of design and color does not hurt to let your personality shine through your uniform. V Coterie is a leading provider of healthcare jewelry and accessories for playful, everyday wear, from pins to bad jewel charms and medical specialty-specific necklaces. With their creative process paralleling the founder's background in dentistry, V Coterie was founded to spark the genius within you, redefining the traditional boundaries for jewelry and accessories. They believe fashion can celebrate curiosity and the pursuit of knowledge while allowing you to express your truest self. From the curious student to a confident clinician or even a kidney transplant survivor, Vicodery is here to celebrate you no matter where the journey takes you. Get 15% off your first order with the code VFRIENDSOFRANCE on vcodery.com. Find your daily dose of style and make your passion your fashion. As someone with acne-prone skin, I always fear using new moisturizers that may be too heavy on my skin and clog my pores. This is why I love my Aloe Quench by Skin by Anthos a facial moisturizer made for all skin types, especially for sensitive skin like mine. Made with an oil-free formula using aloe, glycerin, and green tea, it is suitable for acne-prone, oily, or combination skin. Its soothing and paraben-free formula makes it even great for sunburns and patients taking Accutane. Skin by Anthos is the byproduct of the minds and expertise of board-certified dermatology professionals and proud AAPI mothers who saw the need for access to pharmaceutical strength and professional-grade skin care for those with sensitive skin and or skin of color from the safety and convenience of home. Experience a regimen tailored to your skin type that is strong enough to deliver medical-grade results for 20% off with the code FRANCEPODCAST when you order on skinbyanthos.com. The sense of taste is so intriguing. A cascade of good memories can wash over you as you experience the flavor you have met before. Founded by Hannah Bay, Halmi, a loving nickname for grandma in Korean, is a brand of light sparkling beverages that evokes feelings of nostalgia for Koreans and Asians in general, but also curiosity if you are not familiar with certain ingredients and the story behind the flavors. Inspired by traditional Korean flavors through family recipes and made with real fruits and spices, 
Ami's debut flavor, Cinnamon Ginger Jujube Persimmon, is a sparkling take on Korea's beloved Sujongwa, a sweet and spice punch that has been brewed for generations to aid digestion and is shared during Korea's most festive moments. It's their version of a healthier, lighter ginger ale. With the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, you can get 15% off your first order on drinkhalmi.com. Our take in honoring roots, strengthening ancestral connections, and celebrating hyphenated identities with unique, refreshing, and better-for-you ingredients. Is there a food that you always long for? Like comfort I get food? Or? It's a comfort food. I would say like one of my favorite foods and then like a comfort food for me that is a little bit like less accessible is I don't know if you've ever had kaibichim but it's like braised short ribs Mm -hmm. but my mom makes a really good kaibichim and so every time I go home like you know she always makes it for me and my brother and so I would say that's like one food that I crave because I think to get it in restaurants it's a little bit expensive Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. for me I always equate with like going home so Yeah, that would be one of the foods that I would always crave, yeah. Aside from eating now, which I can talk forever about, cooking in itself, if you could summarize your whole life or journey thus far as one dish, whether it's already existent or something that you will make on the spot, what do you think is a dish that kind of gives a symbolism to your journey? Honestly, like, even though it's like, now everyone who's not Korean knows this like this quote unquote. But I would have to say like just a table of Korean barbecue. I mean I think it, it's popular for a reason. And I think I mean for me too, I love it for a reason. And it's because for me it's like a really good way to introduce people who are not familiar with the cuisine or Korean culture to come to the table and be like, okay, here's the meat, here's the veggies, here's the condiments, here's the stew, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. There's just like so many components that come together, including even like, you know, soju. And so for me, I think to summarize my life in one dish, it would be like a table of Korean barbecue because I think it's like all of these like components, I think, came together and all of these people helped support my journey to get to where I am today. And so, yeah, I think for me, it's like the best of all worlds coming together. Yeah. And who doesn't love Korean barbecue, right? Oh. <laughs> and now mixing it all together, you know, the world of medicine, and culinary arts, for sure you've met so many patients in your career thus far, right? Who I guess you obviously have cared for and g- grew a relationship with, right? And uh, if, if there is one dish that you could make or cook for a dear patient who maybe you're ready to go in life at, at the end of the road. What would yeah. be that dish and why? Yeah, so I think that's a really tough question. Um, I think um, I've seen a lot of patients, you know, end of life and, you know, a lot of like goals of care discussions where it's like, you know, if they eat, they could aspirate. But like I've seen so many patients where I actually ran into this where it's like, okay, you could choke, you could die, you could aspirate, but like, do you? want to do comfort feeds or like is there something you would like to eat and then i think every patient does have a specific dish that they create that's their comfort food and so i guess i can't dictate like what one dish it would be but i think i would talk with each patient and be like okay what would be your dish how did your relatives or how did you make it and then i would try to customize it for each person because i think as your last meal you know you deserve to go out with something that you know, brings you to, you know, memories of Korea, yeah. you know, and so I think it's a very personalized. Yeah, I, I guess it's like, like I said, right, food brings nostalgia and I guess it's like time yeah. not for them and things that's comfortable for them. I can't imagine how stressful <laughs> life and work has been as a physician and also as a chef now. Are there things that you do outside of those fields that service your decompression, whether it be hobbies or anything like that? Yeah, um, hobbies. I mean, I really love hiking. I think within LA, there's so many beautiful places to hike. Um, I love reading. I don't know. I mean, sometimes it just involves like me just vegetating, watching Netflix and decompressing. And then, yeah, other times just like, I think just like hanging out with loved mm-hmm. ones and just like 
sipping on wine and decompressing. Yeah, I would say those are kind of like the biggest things. And then recently, like I've started using Headspace, which mm. you know, I would tell patients all the time, like, oh yeah, like work on your sleep hygiene and try using Calm or Headspace. Yeah. But I've never personally used it myself, but <laughs> I feel like the last couple of weeks I've had like insomnia where I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot sleep. And Headspace actually legitimately works. So I've started using that and like meditating more. Yeah. I mean, in times of also where you can't sleep, do you also find yourself like watching videos or going to a rabbit hole on YouTube or anything like that? For me, when I can't sleep, I don't use electronics. So I'm like, I know in my mind that's going to worsen it. So I'm like, like, let's just, I don't know, like get up, do yeah. something, try to read yeah. or... Yeah. yeah, I'm curious, as a chef, do you also watch cooking shows as well? <laughs> um, that's funny. Like, I think, you know, when I was not in the industry for a long time, I mean, I love cooking shows. I mean, I would say whether I'm in the industry or not, I love Top Chef. Like, Top mm. Chef, top, like, I would always love those. But I do think more and more I'm back in the kitchen, like, I have no interest in watching <laughs> cooking shows. And I don't know, a lot of people are like, oh, as a chef, you must make, like, gourmet meals. But actually, like, most chefs, like, you just want to come home and sleep or like eat like a piece of toast. Like, you know, I think most chefs don't cook elaborate meals at home. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think it's just like, it's similar to medicine, right? Like, I mean, I'll read like medical journals and stuff, but personally, I will not read like medical nonfiction like ever. I'm like, <laughs> why would I spend time doing that? Like more medicine, you know? Yeah. So for me, I'm all about like fiction, like, you know, poetry, whatever. But yeah. Will not read medical books. Yeah. I mean, my mom has been a nurse for like over 30 years and she just recently retired too. And there was one time I was like, oh, you want to watch this new movie? It's about this nurse, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I have no intention of watching anything about the hospital afterwards. I watch zero medical shows, honestly. Honestly, me too. Yeah. I don't think I've ever watched Grace and Madden as well. Me, but, me too. I just, I can't. Do it. But, you know, it's it's been so great hearing your journey about not only medicine, but, you know, being a chef and, and the culinary arts. And it's just a beautiful story of like just service, right? In, in two different arenas where it seems to be so different, right? I mean, you're both serving people, but in different ways, like you're serving them clinically as a physician and then also serving them food you know which gives a lot of feel good feelings and you know nostalgia and also discovery of different dishes and stuff there's someone out there whether it's a kid or a teen or a young <laughs> adult who maybe also caught in the dilemma of oh i want to be a physician but i also love to cook and maybe this is the path i want to take <laughs> what would be your message for that person well i would say like this is just like for anyone wanting to pursue the culinary field or like think about like i think it is i mean medicine too but it's such a difficult field and it's such a difficult like profession to pursue like i think everything we see on tv it's so glorified and it looks great but like you know, you're on your feet like 12, 14 hours, like you're washing dishes, like it's really tough work. And so I would say anyone who wants to be like, I want to be a chef or go into culinary, like I would encourage them to like work in restaurants, see what it's actually like, because it's not like being a home cook. It's not about being passionate about cooking because, you know, you're going to be making the same stuff over and again, over and over and, mm -hmm. you know, like customers love that food, but I think it's like a very different thing. So I think for both medicine too, right? Like we always say you should shadow and see what mm -hmm. it's like. I think for culinary too, like it looks so glorified, but I think we have to really explore and be like, is this what I want? Um, but I would also want to encourage them and be say and say that like you can do what you want and you can pursue what you want and nobody can dictate what you're going to do in your life like i mean so many people in my path even now like i think there are a lot of haters in both fields who are like okay he hasn't worked in the kitchen that long or like he's a doctor now he's gonna leave that field to do what so I think for me, it's like, I think people have followed my journey because I've always been true to who I am. So I would encourage people to just be like, just be open 
to opportunities. I think whatever opportunity presents, like just be grateful and take advantage and work as hard as you can. And I think if something's meant to work out, it will. Um, if something's not meant to work out, it won't. But I think it's just about being yourself, being open to opportunities and working hard and giving it all. That would be my advice. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you again for sharing your journey with me. When's the next pop-up? Oh. Uh, actually, next pop-up is next weekend. So uh, me and Justin, that should be literally right before I did like five dishes. We photographed them. Oh, Wait, because I, I think I'm going to be in Cali next week. Oh, or, if you're or in the LA, week yeah, after. Too. Wait, what? Is it only like a one day thing? It's a three days at this wine bar in downtown LA. Oh, um, oh my gosh. Thir- next Thursday to Saturday. <gasps> oh, I don't know if I'll make it. But, okay. but... <laughs> yeah, if you can. Otherwise, no worries. There'll be more. So. I, I think I'm arriving at LA like Saturday night next oh. week. So. Oh. Well, it could work. We'll see. Yeah. Well, again, it's been such a great conversation talking about your journey. I mean, it's really super inspiring and super making me hungry right right now thinking about all the food. And thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. me. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you get some rest tonight. I know you made a lot of dishes. Thank you. Have a good night.